Hello world, Noah here. Python 3.7 was just released the other day. Uh, it's the latest version of Python, and it brings about some interesting changes. In this video, we're going to take a look at just a few of them. Now, here is the Python website, which sort of um, details all of the changes that were made, and it details them in good detail. But in this video, we're just going to take a look at three of the biggest changes, three of the changes that you're most likely to encounter in your daily programming. And we're just going to look at them well enough that you could actually use them. We're not going to discuss sort of the, the very nitty gritty details, uh, but these are the kinds of things that you really wouldn't need to know in order to get the most out of these features. So if you do want to learn more about all the features, if you want to learn about them in depth, you can find the link to this page in the description below. Uh, but otherwise, we'll take a look at some of the features that you're probably going to find uh, when you're actually writing your code. And so before we can do that, you of course need to update your version of Python. And so you could go to the Python website and do that. If you go to downloads, you'll notice that Python 3.7 is available there. Uh, or if you use a package manager, you should be able to get it from there. I use Homebrew, and it took uh, a couple days from after Python 3.7 was released for it to appear there, but it is there now. So if you use Homebrew, you can brew update and brew upgrade, and you will get Python 3.7 installed. So without further ado, let's go ahead and actually take a look at three of the biggest new features in Python 3.7. I'll go ahead and open up a PyCharm project uh, that I had set up. And I set my interpreter in PyCharm to Python 3.7, uh, as you can see right there. And we don't need to worry about a beta version of PyCharm or anything like that, because all of these new features um, will still work in the current version of PyCharm. It's not like there were any new keywords or anything like that um, where you would need to get a beta version of the editor so that it would understand what you're doing. So without further ado, let's actually go ahead and get started. We're going to look at three features, as I said, and we're going to go uh, from sort of the smaller features up to the bigger ones. And the first one we're going to take a look at is the nanosecond resolution in the time module. If I go ahead and import time, you'll notice um, that there were some new functions added to the time module. These functions end in underscore ns. So there's the time ns. There's another one. I think there's about five or six of these. But all of these that end in NS are nanosecond resolution instead of the previous versions, which I think are millisecond resolution. The nanosecond resolution functions are more accurate. And so you're probably not going to notice much of a difference. I can give uh, a little example here. We'll print time first and then time NS. So you'll notice that time ns returns the current time as, as an integer, not a floating point number. Um, but the nanosecond version is supposedly about three times more accurate than the regular version. And so you probably won't notice a difference if you switch between them in your day-to-day -day programming. But if you do need uh, nanosecond time in Python, now you finally have a way to do that. So I'm sure there are places uh, where that's useful. Next, we'll take a look at a feature that is probably a little bit more practical, and it has to do with debugging. And specifically, it has to do with setting breakpoints. And so to give an example, I'll go ahead and print A, and I'll print B. And so if I go ahead and run this, it'll do exactly what you think. It'll print A, and then it'll print out B, just like that. Um, but let's say that this was, you know, some bigger code base. We were, uh, you know, we had some function and we were trying to debug it. Well, you'd probably want to set a breakpoint. And essentially what happens with a breakpoint is you can set a specific place in your code where you want the execution to pause. And when the execution pauses there, you can take a look at the values of all the variables. Uh, you can see sort of what's going on, and then you can step through line by line and figure out exactly what your function is doing, which is really useful when you're dealing uh, with debugging, trying to figure out what's wrong with your code. And so if we wanted to stick a breakpoint in between A and B to have the execution pause there, um, in the previous versions of Python, we would have to do something like import pdb for Python debugger, and then pdb.setTrace, just like that. And so if I run this, you'll see uh, that it prints out A, just like we thought. And then it pauses the execution at this line right here. And I could go ahead and say next and for next. And it'll actually run that line, and it'll print B. And then it's going to pause at the next line. And you know I could go ahead and quit it. 
this isn't actually an error, it's just, um, I'm just quitting it. Um, but essentially, there's a lot more you can do with it. This video is not about debugging. Um, but the point is that you can set a breakpoint right there, and then you can pause the execution and uh, test it. Now, you'll notice that uh, PEP, which is the Python style guidelines, are, is uh, complaining a little bit. It's complaining that this import is not at the very top of the file, and that there's a semicolon that we have more than one statement on a line. Now, you could you know, separate these into different lines. You could take the import statement and move it up to the top. But now you sort of have these two separate lines that kind of go together. Um, and then let's say you go ahead and delete the trace, but you forget to delete the import, and now you have an import left which is kind of annoying. And the real big thing is if you're using some other sort of debugging library instead of PDB, uh, then you would write some other code in order to basically set a breakpoint there. And so what Python did in Python 3.7 is they added a global function called breakpoint that essentially acts in the same way, uh, but it's a little bit nicer. And so let's take a look at that. So I'm going to go ahead and delete this PDB related code. And now if I want to set a breakpoint between A and B, I just call the breakpoint function. I don't need to import anything at all. It's a global function, uh, just like print is. And so if we go ahead and run this, you'll notice that it does the exact same thing. It prints out A, and then by default, it's going to use PDB right there. I'll go ahead and quit it. Um, but essentially, it's going to do the exact same thing that it did before, but it's in one line, and uh, there's no imports or anything like that. This is pretty similar to the debugger uh, keyword in JavaScript, um, but you could think of it as just a Python version of that. Now, the cool thing about this breakpoint function is that you can use this function, and any debugging library can uh, basically take advantage of it. And so to give you an example, um, we can take a look. If we look at the sys module, there was a new um, function added called breakpoint hook. And this breakpoint hook function is called whenever the breakpoint function is called. And so just to give you an example, I could go ahead and re-implement this function. I could change the, uh, the implementation to just print out hello. And so if I go ahead and run this, you'll see that it says A and then hello and then B. So this just shows that when we call the breakpoint function, it will actually call the sys.breakpoint hook function. Now this is completely useless for setting breakpoints because it just prints out the message hello. But the idea is that any Python debugging library could just set the uh, implementation of breakpoint hook and then when you call breakpoint, that will be called automatically. So you could switch between different libraries for um, debugging, and you don't have to worry about changing your debugging code to you know, set the breakpoint using some other function. It's just one function set the breakpoint, and it can be used um, anywhere. Now, of course, if you uh, use PyCharm, you can just click in the gutter to set a breakpoint. And when you run in debug mode, you'll see that it pauses there. It'll show all the variables if I had any, and it'll let you step through all the lines of code, so on and so forth. Uh, but if you're not using PyCharm, if you're using PDB or some other debugging library, then you'll probably find this to be useful. And the last thing we're going to take a look at is, in my opinion, the most interesting change, which is data classes. You can essentially think of data classes as a better version of the named tuple utility um, that Python provides. And so to demonstrate this, we're going to implement um, a person object, a person class, using named tuples, and then using the uh, data class, the new data class um, feature. And so to do this, if we were doing it the old way, we would basically say, uh, we would call the named tuple uh, function, the named tuple constructor like that. And then we would first pass the name of our class, which is person. And then we pass an array of the values, in this case, name and age. And then we could go ahead and create a person. So Noah equals person. Uh, and then it's going to do the name and the age. And you'll notice that PyCharm is pretty smart because it knows that person has uh, a name value and an age value. And so it's going to suggest that to me uh, right up there. And of course, this does work. I can print, you know, Noah.name, for example. Um, and if I go ahead and run this, it's going to do exactly what you expect it to. Um, but it does leave some things to be desired. And so we're going to actually re-implement this 
using the data class feature, and then I think you'll come to see why the data class is a lot better. So to implement a data class, you start by declaring just a regular old Python class. So we're going to make a class called person. And then you're not going to write an init function, but you're going to, for each value that you want your uh, class to have, you're going to just declare it outright. So name and age. And when you're declaring them uh, in this class, you want to actually specify the type, just like this. This is the uh, type system that was added to Python in a previous version. Um, it allows you to basically just do static type analysis uh, on your Python code to make it more clear. Uh, basically, this is the first of a few benefits that we get on data class, and it's that we can actually specify the types of our values. So here we make this name tuple with name and age, but name could be any value and age could be any value, whereas in reality, name should be a string and age should be an integer. Um, and so by using the data class uh, feature, it will allow us to specify the types. And so to turn this from a class into a data class, all you have to do is just add the data class annotation like that. And we'll go ahead and import it. Okay. So by adding this annotation, Python is essentially going to generate a bunch of code for us. It's going to generate the init function. It's going to generate the repr function, which is used for getting a string representation of the object. It's similar to the str function. Um, it'll also generate the equals and not equals and greater than, less than, greater than or equal to, less than or equal to. And the way that those work is it will compare each of these values in order. So if I wanted to know if one person's greater than another person, it'll compare their names to see if the first person's name is greater than the second person's name, which would be alphabetical order. And then it would compare their ages, which would be numbers. So all those functions get implemented for you. And so what I can do is I can do the exact same line of code to create a new person. And you'll notice that it's going to again suggest name and age, but this time it's able to specify that name should be a string and age should be an int. So I can do just like that. And if I were to sort of uh, violate this, if I said name is 19.0, then it's going to give me a warning here that it knows it's supposed to be an int, but I gave it a floating point number instead. And so that's just one of the reasons why data class is, uh, is a nice feature to have. So we can take a look and see, um, essentially, that we have all the same stuff from before. We have the name and age. So if I go ahead and print out name, it's going to print out the exact same thing that it did before. If I just print um, the object itself, you'll see that it gives this nice output, just like that. And if we go and do that here, then you'll notice that it gives the exact same output. So you get the same output for um, you know printing it as a string from the name tuple and from the data class. So you're not going to notice a difference there, uh, which is good. Uh, but the first change, the first thing that we said was better, or I guess really there's two things so far. The first is that you actually declare it as a class instead of a variable, which I think looks a little bit cleaner. And then the second one is that you can add type annotations um, to the variables. Uh, the next thing you can do is you can actually specify default values. So we're going to add an alive uh, boolean, which is going to be a boolean, of course. And so you'll notice that this is going to complain here because I have not given a value for alive, but I can actually specify a default just like that. So I can say that alive is going to be true by default. And so you'll see here, I don't need to specify that value and it's just going to automatically have it there. If I go here and I add alive, then I need to actually go ahead and say that it's true. And that will give me the same, um, you know, the same sort of uh, output. But the idea is that you can specify default values here, whereas you can't do that uh, in the name tuple. And another great thing that you can do is you can actually write uh, functions. So we could write, this is a pretty useless function, but uh, it would basically just say, we could actually use a format string. We can say, uh, my name is name or self.name. And I am self.age years old. Uh, this is a format string. This was added, I believe, in Python 3.6. Um, it's just sort of a nicer way of uh, you know, writing a string and then calling dot .format. Uh, but essentially, the idea is that this describe function um, will 
uh, will just print out a sentence with the name and age. And so I can actually call it like that and you'll see that it go, goes ahead and prints that out as expected. This isn't really something that you could do uh, with the name tuple. You can't really you know, add a function to it, or if you did, it really wouldn't be clean. But here, since we're writing in the class-based syntax, we can actually just go ahead and add functions to it. I could even, if I wanted to, make this a property, and I could call it description, and then I could just uh, you know, look at that and it'll work in the exact same way. So the basic idea is that when you use the data class annotation, it will automatically generate uh, some of the boilerplate code for you, um, but it allows you to write everything using the class-based syntax so you get greater control over um, you know, all of your code versus using a name tuple. Now this is more code here than the name tuple uh, on its own, but in general, you're gonna get more features with the data class, and uh, I personally think that it's a much nicer alternative to the name tuple. Name tuple is not going anywhere, and there are some cases uh, where it just makes more sense to use name tuple. Uh, but in a lot of cases, uh, data class will definitely be nice in cutting back on some boilerplate code. There are some arguments you can pass to data class. Um, you can basically disable things like you could make the uh, you can make it not generate an init function you can make it not generate an repr function all these functions so on and so forth um, you could set frozen to be true and it would essentially make it immutable or equivalent to immutable um, so there are other options you can do that we're not really going to take a look at um, but they're pretty much self-explanatory um, and it just makes the data class annotation even better so that's all for this video. We took a look at three of the most interesting features in Python 3.7 being nanosecond resolution in the time module, the new breakpoint function, and data classes. I hope that this gives you sort of a good idea of uh, what to expect with Python 3.7, and I hope uh, that you're excited to start using these features in your code from day to day. So as always, subscribe if you want to see more comment with what you want to learn. If you like this video, click the like button. I'll see you guys soon with some more coding. Bye for now.